I guess uh, if you're here for the steampunk fashion show, you are in the right place. If you are here for something completely different, uh, stay anyway, because this is better. That's more like it. Okay, let's get this show on the road. In Ace's King's younger years, he was known as a low down, no good, lying cheat. Whoa. Hey now, I'm just telling them what I've heard. Eventually, all that lying and cheating caught up to him. Aces was caught cheating at poker by the notorious outlaw Jeb the Hatchet Phillips. Jeb didn't take kindly to losing so many hands, so he figured it was Aces' turn to lose one. <coughs> Literally. As Jeb left Aces for dead, his parting words were, Save me a seat at the table when you get to hell. As you can tell, his story didn't end there. Aces was found by a scientist, Dr. Reginald Sawyer, who managed to not only save Aces' life that day, but also build him a robotic arm. Aces had just one single request for that arm. I wanted to have a gun, he said. A big gun. A gun big enough to blow a hole straight to hell. To which Sawyer responded, well, why would you want to do that? And because, Ace said, I'm saving someone a seat. <laughs> Ace's King is a character in the steampunk western comic The Legend of Everett Forge, which is currently on Kickstarter. Yeah. Cheers, we want all your applause, and now's where you get to take lots and lots of photographs. American adventurer and explorer Joe Clock and his French cartographer wife Barbara have signed on to Flagstaff's Lowell Observatory to lead the Mars Task Force. Their mission? To map the canals of Mars and make contact with the locals, whether they be hostile or not. to Earth from the distant planet of Mongo in pursuit of his nemesis. <laughs> Comes the Emperor of Mongo, Ming the Merciless. Hail Ming! streets of Gotham City huh? and the timeless island of Themyscira 
from two of the founding members of the Steampunk Justice League. Yeah! Hey, you cheered louder for the bad guy. The Steampunk Justice League! We are here to ensure that all Tucson remains free of any and all threats from criminals from Earth or any other planet. Both costumes were created on vintage sewing machines. Batman's was sewn on a 1906 Davis treadle machine. Wonder Woman's? You go, I like this. You, you don't want to cheer for the good guys, but you cheer for the sewing machines. <laughs> Wonder Woman's was created on a 1960s Singer 401. the 1930s, Carmen Miranda is brought to you today <laughs> by an elusive clockwork maker who had the vision to create a doll in the image of his daughter Penelope, who later developed split personalities. You may recognise that key, usually found in conjunction with personality Penny Black. But today, this doll has transformed into the wonderful star that graced the stage for nearly 30 years as singer, actress, and dancer. Let's hope she can maintain one personality for the whole show. This costume in its entirety, including the earrings, were created by its wearer, Tisha Faye Lewis. position of headmistress at her namesake great aunt's boarding school, the Heavens to Murgatroyd finishing school for girls who should be finished. <laughs> In addition to teaching a wide variety of subjects, her responsibilities now include preventing midnight knickers raids by the students from the nearby Fagin's Reformatory School for Unruly Boys. Professor Percival Ogilvy, gentleman astronomer and scientist, was recently awarded the Order of the Golden Dome by the John Carter Academy of Martian Studies. At a lavish ceremony, the professor distinguished himself during his three-hour acceptance speech by expounding on the virtues of his scientifically designed enclosed gondolas in which he hopes to traverse the canals of Mars in proper style. <laughs>
Walsh hails from San Diego. Yeah. That's where her interpretation of a Thermion from the film Galaxy Quest. This was her first costume build from scratch in 2015, and it dissuaded her from ever sewing again. She's been involved in steampunk since 2010 and was given a heavy assist on this costume by Stitch, Michelle Peoples. In the film, the Thermium homeworld had been destroyed 100 years prior, so this is how those diasporid people would have dressed. She's carrying her granddaughter, Laliari. Her, her appearance modulator is broken, uh, who's portrayed in the film by Missy Pyle. Karina's dress is made from the finest LA garment district, $2 a yard polyester. <laughs> Ensemble includes a Thermion probe <laughs> and a peek at a species more tentacly appearance. Yeah. Her insignia is etched and painted brass and has been admired by the writer producers of the film itself. And as Karina walks the stage, please greet her in the appropriate fashion. Dragoon, the string punk band DEVM, take a little shore leave to get their feet on the ground and a good night's rest in a bed that's not moving with the wind. A little good food, drink, and the occasional barroom brawl is just what the doctor ordered. Jedi General Obi-Wan Kenobi, commander of the Union Army's 212th Battalion. Just Ben. Quiet old Ben. That crazy old wizard who lives way out by Pueblo Pintado in the New Mexico Territory, where nothing but coyotes and raiders go. Ben the Hermit, the forgotten relic. Instead of battling Sith Lords and Separatists, he's battling monotony and inactivity. <laughs> now in self-exile, he arrives at his new home in the desert.
Here we have Gwynny B looking a little frozen. It seems that she was captured by aliens, and man, was that a mistake on their part. <laughs> uh, they figured out just how big a mistake when the Queen Bee started prowling their ship, hunting them down one by one. The desperate survivors managed to trick her into an airlock, where they ejected her into the vacuum of space. Uh, luckily, Grundle T. Thigomancer happened to be passing by, rescued her, and is now working to thaw her heart with his love. Doric brandy wine. <laughs> Duelist, adventurer, raconteur, winner of the All Arizona Best Waxed Moustache 12 years in a row, and the proud owner of the airship Hyperbole, which is clearly a thousand times better than your airship. <laughs> <laughs> He's proudly attending his eighth Wild Wild West Con with his family. Yay! Yeah! Everyone deserves a cheer. And somehow we haven't managed to throw him out yet. Security! <laughs> Professor Brandywine is wearing his own handmade kilt of imported French cloth. Denim. He is... You can be quicker than that. He is holding a panel tomorrow at a time to be written somewhere else. Uh, to share the skill. What time is the panel? 4 p.m. And where would it be, Dirk? In the courthouse at 4 p.m. Tomorrow, Professor Theodoric Brandywine. trying that twirl, I'll get arrested. <laughs> After completing a circumnavigation of the Sovereign Empire in their airship, the Carthage, Lord Constantine Percival, explorer and pilot of the HME Carthage, and Lady Charlotte, regent of the Western Lands and tamer of the Four Winds, returned to the Sovereign Capital City. The five-year journey changed Percival. Gone was the brash, boisterous adventurer. The man who returned was quiet, introspective, and driven by an intense energy to go where no other sovereign explorer had dared to go, into the heart of the Carthaginian badlands to chart that vast and mysterious region. The Sovereign Explorers Guild, of which Lord Percival and Lady Sharla were members, declined to authorise or to fund the expedition, but his lordship used his family's fortune, useful that, isn't it? <laughs> to fund the expedition and steer the Carthage past the Guardians and through the gateway into the Badlands. Lord Percival, Lady Sharla, their crew, and the Carthage were never seen again. 
To this day, the uncharted region of the Carthaginian Badlands is known as Percival's Folly. as a stinging tribute to Lord Percival and a reminder that not all mysteries are meant to be solved. traverse the interdimension known as L space, which connects all dense collections of books through the multiverse. Sometimes she crosses paths with strange seeming beings who also travel this way, but despite appearances they are much the same as the librarians we know. It just proves the old adage, you can't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> was traveling home from a routine mission into space when his one-man capsule, Stardust One, came down far from the planned recovery area on a deserted island in the South Pacific. On the beach, Tony noticed a strange bottle that rolled by itself. He removed the stopper and rubbed the bottle. Smoke shot out and a Persian-speaking female genie materialized <laughs> and kissed Tony on the lips, utterly shocking this poor sheltered 1950s astronaut. <laughs> genie fell in love with Tony at first sight after being trapped for 2,000 years. As he was being rescued, she popped back into her bottle and rolled it into Tony's duffel bag so that she could accompany him back home. The rest of the story, ladies and gentlemen, goes down in steamy history. <laughs>
the witch goddess of the sea, is portrayed today by Madame Nelly Zell. Calypso is said to have lured Greek hero Odysseus to land, where she was admired and adored for seven years. But alas, her love was not enough to overcome his longing for home. In her ravenous rage, she now wields the Kraken, who ensures her wildest whims, punishing those who thwart her control and dashing them to the depths of Davy Jones's locker. Yeah, let's, let's cheer to dashing people to the depths of Davy Jones's locker. Yes. Yes. This rusted Calypso rendition captures all the glory of this marvelous goddess from the sea, from her hair to her caged bosom to her flowing tattered skirt with steamed twist. The entire costume, from wig to ground, was made by Mal Madame Zell's counterpart, Carol Lewis. Yeah. among you. Don't you be scared as they walk through the streets. They're the only out to either break your heart or take your loot. First we see is the lovely Nautica Hellfire. If her beauty don't make you smile, her dagger will ensure it from ear to ear. Then be the sexy Ivy Draven. Her older sister, Poison, never learned all the family skills. And if a whip is set free, I would not want to be ye. Last, but surely not the least, be the fair Lucky Z. Don't let her graceful movements and a delicate smile fool ye. Her swordplay is something you don't want to see. Now, you have been warned, and you have seen. This here be the dread dolls of Coco Pelly's curse. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Curse, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> to quote Kelly Sue DeConnick, folks want to blame someone for gals like us. Her daddy was unkind, or some fella broke her heart. Hogwash! You and me've always been like this, always a little removed, always dreaming of higher, further, faster, more, always more. We came into this world spitting mad, running full bore. To or from what, I ain't never been able to tell. Over the years, I've come to think of these particular traits as the shared attributes of a chosen people. The Lord put us here. 
to punch holes in the sky. And when the soul is born with that kind of purpose, it'll damn sure find a way. We're going to get where we're going, you and me. Death and indignity be damned. We'll get there. And we will be the stars we were always meant to be. Lady Ember Brennan Sparks has been an extremely enthusiastic Captain Marvel fan for years. Yeah! This is a Captain Marvel costume. It's an original interpretation of the character as a Wild West Sky Marshal, or rather, Captain. The costume is a mix of purchased and created pieces. The belt, vest, and coat were all made by hand by her design. No matter how many times she is knocked down to the dirt, she will always get back up to fly and fight. Higher, further, faster. Ladies and gentlemen. difficulties, ladies and gentlemen. Now, welcoming to the stage, our beloved Madame Askew! <laughs> Along of the two ambassadors to the Galactic Steampunk Federation. Wearing a black and gold ambassadorial finery, Madame Askew's overskirt is a delightfully cheeky velvet with an underskirt and bodice of fine silk. Delicately adorned with intricate appliques. Atop her head, she wears her most regal of bicorns. But alas, where is her essential other, the Grand Arbiter? Surely it's not possible that she would enter without him.
music for a second, please? Thank you so much. Ah, uh, there he is! The Grand Arbiter, the second and equally mandatory ambassador has entered upon his most formal of sedan chairs carried by the intern brigade. This chair was crafted by the gentleman robot and Lady Pepper and was a truly magnificent sight. The Grand Arbiter is in his velvet coat, bedecked with appliques matching Madame Skews, a beautiful silk waistcoat and linen trousers, lovingly crafted by Madame Askew and Evie Betts. Men's wear extraordinary. And of course, as it is the year of the cape, Madame Askew and the Grand Arbiter are wearing matching silk and velvet capes. For the drama, of course. These extravagant outfits are bound to leave any extraterrestrial agape with awe and majesty. Thank you for gracing us with your diplomatic presence. And 19C, please. That's the show, ladies and gentlemen. Do you want to see everybody else? Yeah! Do you want to see all the models again? Yeah! What are the winning lottery numbers for next weekend? <laughs> Before we bring everybody out again, I want to bring out Countess Chaos. Yeah! Because Countess Chaos runs this show. Count Chaos, I am at your service. I'm merely MC. The Countess runs the show without her, there would be nothing. We love you! Countess Chaos, ladies and gentlemen! And I think you said something about the models. Did you want to see those models again? I think you, you might have hinted at that. Give them some noise. Some of them are all the way out of the back of the swing. They need to hear you. Come on, everybody. Get a look at everybody. 
The models will be on stage for a little while after the show, so come on up and get some pictures. I can't even see you anymore, audience. Are you still there? Thank you again, ladies and gentlemen. I am Count Chaos and I endorse this message.